So I recently had the chance to speak with DNC chair candidate Sam Ronan, and he explained why he thinks he should be the next DNC chair. Here's our conversation. So Sam, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run to be the next DNC chair, considering this is probably the worst job in the world to have right now? Sure. Um, so, you know, my background is pretty simple. You know, it starts off with me being an immigrant, my mom being from Germany, me being from Germany, and it ends up with me being a veteran, uh, enlisted in the Air Force seven years, still a reservist. And, you know, if you had asked me five, ten years ago where I would see myself, it definitely wouldn't be here right now running for DNC chair. And, you know, the reason why I'm here is because nobody else has stepped up to the plate. I mean, here you have names like Tom Perez and Keith Ellison, and they just failed to meet the standard. They have failed to rise to the occasion. What we need right now is true leadership, not platitudes and not rhetoric. And, you know, this is going to sound cliche, and I hope it doesn't come off that way, but you know, when I swore that oath to my country, I meant that, you know, I meant that I would protect and defend the Constitution. And when it's being literally just torn to shreds by both political parties and our current administration, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And the fact that so many people don't have a voice and so many people are angry and disenfranchised, it, I had no choice. I mean, I literally had no choice other than to put my foot through the proverbial door. Right, right. And, you know, one thing that I think really struck a lot of people with you is that out of all the DNC chair candidates, like for me anyways, um, I've been extremely frustrated because all of them kind of want to bury their head in the sand and not talk about what happened in 2016. So, I mean, just for the sake of, uh, you know, letting my viewers know where you stand, what mm -hmm. is your position on the 2016 Democratic primaries? Do you think that the DNC was unfair to Bernie Sanders? And do you agree that they basically rigged it against Bernie Sanders and progressives? And you know what? I'll take it even a step further. They not only rigged it against uh, Bernie Sanders and progressives, I mean, they rigged it against everyone, everyone who was an outsider, myself included. Okay, so, I mean, granted, I couldn't participate in, in the democratic process because I was in the military. We're not allowed to. Um, so I've been in politics all of since 2015. And so I'm an outsider. I'm running for the first time. I'm new to this party. I'm new to the city and the state, uh, the county, I mean. <clears throat> And I'm trying to run for Congress. And they already have their person picked out. It's the friend of the county chairwoman. And so I get pushed to the side first. And then second, I'm given the state representative position that was an open ticket. Um, you know, my military training got in the way a little bit. But even so, the fact that I was pushed out from square one was pretty ridiculous. So multiply that by the Bernie Sanders debacle of them just literally not listening to the will of the people and you know, all the collusion that occurred, absolutely. And I'll, again, a step further, the superdelegates, that is the most ridiculous thing in the world. You take that word just by itself, superdelegates, that already implies that they carry more weight than any other quote unquote delegate. And that's just not right. 11 million votes is the weight they carried out of 500 people. That's ridiculous. That's not democratic. Right. And I like that you're telling us your experience firsthand with what was wrong with the DNC in 2016. So my question then to you is, as someone who's experienced the bias, you know, against progressives and outsiders, basically, what do you say to the Bernie Sanders supporters and progressives who are demoralized right now? How do you get them to come back into the party after they left, after a Dem exit, after Dump Dems mm -hmm. Day? What do you say to bring those people who left back? Because it seems really difficult right now. Oh, it, it is absolutely difficult. And you know what? If I wasn't here doing the, what I'm doing, I, would, I wouldn't listen to me either. But here's, here's the harsh truth that neither side, neither just nobody wants to admit is if the Democratic Party, Party falls right now with the fact that we have a duopoly in our country, if the Democratic Party falls, the GOP stands unopposed. And I think that reality hasn't sunk in. Yes, you need to be angry. I am not telling you not to be angry because... You were screwed over and I was screwed. We were all screwed over. I'm the disenfranchised youth just as much as you are. But I understand that there's a bigger picture at stake. There is um, a greater good that needs to be served right now. And if we let the Democratic Party fall as they deserve, because I admit that they deserve to fall for what they've done, 
we don't have a checks to the balance of the GOP. And right now, the GOP is playing Hitler's playbook. And I'm not saying that as hyperbole, because everybody's compared everybody to Hitler since Hitler's been around, right? But Trump has verbatim followed the Hitler rise to power. We are on step two right now of the administration. This is not a laughing matter. This isn't to be taken lightly. If, if Justice Democrats and the new Congress and the Young Turks and all these other progressive leader groups had the strength to unite all of them into one cohesive unit, I would be backing them or I'd be at home doing whatever I do. But the fact of the matter is they're too young because the reason for their being is too recently. And so that infrastructure isn't there, that clout isn't there, that that strength that you need to be a party is not there, unfortunately. And I will admit, unfortunately. So we have to take it upon ourselves to do what we need to do. And that means taking over the Democratic Party. And I want to emphasize take it over, not fix, not put a Band-Aid on it. We have to take it over. And that's why from day one in Houston, we have to be held accountable. We, the party needs to regain its trust. And if we don't do that, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter who's running or who's the chair. If we don't regain trust, it's a moot point. So to your question and to be more succinct, me reaching out to Berniecrats and progressives is saying as a Berniecrat, as a progressive, as all these things, we need to come together. But when we do, we need to be the ones in charge saying what needs to happen. That's why all of my emphasis, all of my plans are on giving power back to the people. We need a centralized uh, communication structure so there's bottom-up communication and, and top-down communication. Because right now there is none. Go to Democrats.org and type in anything about DNC members or the state uh, contact information. There's nothing. That's a problem. There's no transparency. For the sheer simple fact of having a directory, that'll op op I'm sorry. that opens the doors to, to people to reach out to who these people are. You need to contact your state chair so you know how to rate, run for Senate or, or state rep or something. Uh, or you, just who the hell is your county chair? Where is the party located? I'm having a problem at my county level. I need to elevate it. I'm having problems at my state level. I need to elevate it. The second part is we need a presence back in our, our communities. How do I reach Bernie Kratz? Well, I have to talk to them. I have to go on through their doorstep, knock and say, hi, I'm the DNC. We don't have a presence anywhere in rural America, and that's why our trust is shot. That's why they voted for Trump, even though it was against their best interests. And and it's our fault. I mean, our as in the Democratic Party's fault for doing that. So it, it's extending the olive branch, but it's also a leap of faith that if you join this new Democratic Party under my leadership, we will be building it together. And I think that kind of outreach, which is unique to only my candidacy, would be enough to show that genuine and sincerity to to start anew and do the right thing. Right. And um, you kind of alluded to this as well, but I kind of want to know uh, specifically what you would do differently than Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Donna Brazil. I mean, some of the biggest complaints, obviously, were um, the lack of debates, the closed primaries. So, I mean, as DNC chair, do you promise at least 25 at a minimum debates? I mean, do you promise to fight? I mean, this would be relatively difficult, but I mean, as chair, obviously, you'd have the clout. Do you, mm -hmm. I mean, will you vow to get these closed primaries, the abolished? I mean, what can you do differently to bring more people back into yeah. the party and rebuild trust? Now, I, I do want to hit on the debates thing. It's not so much that 25 is too many or too little. It's at what point are these candidates not just going to completely be repeating themselves and it doesn't serve a greater purpose? I mean, the, the whole point of a debate is to be able to compare and contrast. Whether that's 25, whether that's three or four or five or whatever, that I think we would definitely have to discuss that. And as chair, I'd be open to that conversation. So that's the first thing that sets me apart from uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and um, uh, Donna uh, Brazil. Um, the second thing you said, the, clo uh, the, op the closed primary. And absolutely, we need to open that sucker right up because if we're going to call ourselves the party of the people and it's all in behind the scenes, closed doors, what have you, then... There's, we can't, and and that's that trust issue. I mean, I think uh, this interview is going to revolve around that word, trust, integrity, and accountability. And yes, that is exactly what I intend to bring to the party. Um, how we would go about the open primaries? I mean, that's also up to debate. Um, me personally, if the whole point is to win the most delegates, right, and then have the most support, and then whoever has the most points wins. 
why not make each state worth one point, winner take all? I, I think to simplify the process down to that level would make the most sense. That way, the popular vote among Democrats selects who their winner is. And if it's like a 50-50 split, you know what? Either split the, the vote again or do a recount. Or it's a null thing. I mean, either way, there's there's plenty of discussion to be had. But superdelegates and the algorithm, the who, who knows how to do that calculation anyway, how it was determined who got what half? Because it wasn't simple mathematics. I know that. Um, that, that that's not conducive to the, uh, the political process, let alone the Democratic one. So on those two topics, I mean, we are definitely on board. Um, I would say that I can't pledge to 25 debates because... 25 debates may not be enough or it may be too many. I would rather pledge to have as many debates as it takes to get the point across without oversaturating people with information. Well, okay, let me follow up with this. So first of all, I think that when you talk about winner take all, I don't know that I'm on board with that, honestly, because, okay. um, I mean, this is obviously something that depends on preference, but I do think proportional is fair, is more fair. But I think that you can probably sell that point so long as you maintain just a general consistency when it comes to fairness across the board. Right. So if all candidates are treated fairly. I think you might be able to sell that, but for me, I know I'm not on board. But when it comes to the debate thing, I want to stress with the debates and kind of just um, follow up with this and kind of challenge you on this point. So sure, yeah. when it comes to the debates, I understand that 25 does seem redundant, but the reason why we have so many debates is because some of these candidates, they have a name recognition benefit that really hurts yeah. grassroots candidates. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, for example, going into it, she had a 60 point lead because nobody knew who the hell Bernie Sanders was. So right. I think that part of the DNC and limiting debates was a way to really hide away Bernie Sanders from the public. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're all really sensitive about debates and why we want to have more debates, not less. And, you know, part right. of it, which is strange, is that there's a difference between the 2008 debate style that we had and the 2016 debate style. So in 2008, the DNC only sanctioned about 10 debates, 12 debates, but we did have around 25 debates. And the DNC in 2012 only sanctioned about six debates to start. Now, the difference was that there was an exclusivity clause. So W. Wasserman Schultz literally banned candidates from participating. Uh, from participating in non-DNC debates. So if, for example, CNN wanted to have a debate with Hillary and Bernie, well, then Debbie Wasserman Schultz could step in and say, well, if you guys have this debate, you are now banned because of this exclusivity clause. Um, so that's kind of the thing. Like, it was it was very brazenly arbitrary. So that's why yeah. I'm really, I, I think that uh, we need more debates and not less. And if okay. you end up being redundant, I understand that. But, I mean, getting the word out, I think, is more. And, you know, with Republicans, I really think that they monopolized on uh, political dialogue in the country by having so many debates. And I know that they had more candidates. But, right. you know, I think discussion should be robust. So that's why I just wanted you to. Yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, you can kind of clarify a little bit and hopefully no, lean and, in the direction and, of more and not less. No. And, and see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I have an idea. I have a plan. And I have a reason for it, the logic behind it. Right. And then you come up with a, another suggestion and, and solution. Well, the Debbie Wasserman Schultzes, the the Donna Brazils, the Keith Ellisons, the Tom Perezes, they're going to just shut you down. It's like, no, we're going to do however many I say we're going to do and exclusivity clause this and that. I'm open to the discussion. Like I said, I think 25 is too many. You say 25 is not enough. That's cool. I'm open to that discussion. Um, my whole thing is I just don't ever want it to be oversaturated. Now, Coming from the guy who nobody knows about, I understand where you're coming from. At least it gives that people that exposure. And to that end, I absolutely agree. Um, so most certainly we need to have more opportunities. Um, but considering presidential candidate or uh, campaigns start off uh, more like two years in advance, I, I don't see a problem with having uh, one debate a month or uh, two debates a month. I mean, I think that could possibly be reasonable. Uh, and that would also give us that 50 or that 25 mark. Uh, for sure. And and to that point, yeah, I think that would definitely work. Um, I'm just worried that it would be, you know, while everybody's still feeling out their candidacy for the first six months, the first eight months, if we combine them all at the final six months or before the primaries or, you know, six months before the primaries and we're just doing 25 back to back one a week, we might lose people on it. Sure, That's the sure. only part of that debate. And I, so I get that. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we're on the same page now, or at least where, where we're coming from it. And again, that's a healthy discussion. 
Um, the second thing, or the first thing you said, uh, the debates, um, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the first part? The debates with the one thing and then the, the other part of your question. Um, so let me think back. So with the debates, um, the exclusivity clause was something I brought up. Right. The exclusivity, I mean, that has got to go. I mean, if CNN wants to host a debate, let them. I, hell, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be right up there with them. I'll, I'll moderate the damn thing. I, I don't care. Um, shucks, I really forget. Oh, no, no, the primary process. Um, yeah, the open primary, though, the winner-take-all thing. The only reason why I say winner-take-all, because if it had been a winner-take-all, it might have made the discussion of did Bernie get completely shut out or did Hillary get enough votes? But then again, I get what you're saying. If there was going to be collusion, that would be the simplest way to do it. If it's a winner-take-all and there is, you know, quote-unquote hanky-panky happening in, in, the, in the tallies, then, of course, that becomes more convoluted. So to your point, I, I agree and I understand that. Um, that's why I said ideally, or, or, or I hope I should have said that. Um, I, that's what I mean. Ideally, it would be a winner-take-all system with integrity and, and accountability all across the board. Um, the whole, the calculation of who gets how many delegates, it just has to be simpler. It either has to be a, a legitimate percentage, like if Hillary got 50% of the vote and Bernie only got 47 or, you know, some amount of math, you know, that, then it should be split by that. And if it's not an even split, like, say there's only 10 or only like seven delegates or something like that, that's not going to be a very easy split when we're talking 43% versus 57% or something. So, you know, at some point we're going to have to, you know, really get into the weeds. Maybe just straight do it. Calculations. You get 3.765 points or delegates based on your percentage. And I'm okay with that too. I think going forward as a chairman with with those specific things that affect so many people it has to be a group decision it can't be up to me it can't be up to just one person it has to be a consensus maybe even voted on i know that makes things more convoluted because more ideas but eventually there's there's usually just a grouping of ideas with slightly different paths and then those five or six different main ideas end up coalescing into one and i'm that is what I want to focus on. So for your answer, I want to make it a group decision. I don't want to make it my decision whether or not I have thoughts on the idea. Totally. And you know what I like is that we're going to have disagreements on certain things. You're never mm -hmm. going to agree with someone on 100% of the issues. But I think that what sets you apart from the, the other DNC candidates is you actually exactly. demonstrate the capacity to listen. Like when it right. comes to the DNC chair candidates, you know, it's it's my way or the highway. That's how it's been with Debbie. That's how it's right. been with Donna Brazil. And that's what's so frustrating. It's that, yeah, you're never going to agree. Progressives are very opinionated. I'm obviously opinionated. <laughs> but if you don't listen, you make things exponentially worse so, so i commend you for that because we're not going to agree on everything well and see and that's you bring up that very valuable point it, it is my way or the highway for every single other candidate and in some cases they're their own biggest fan and and that's just that's not the, what this is all about and actually that is why we we are where we are today because we haven't been listening if we've been listening to people this shit wouldn't be happening right um, totally well i don't know we might have to <laughs> anyway if we had been listening in the first place, none of this would be happening. We wouldn't be having these DNC chair debates. We wouldn't be worried about Donna Brazil because we'd already be listening. The problem is we're not, and we're not holding our members accountable. Uh, up until the Debbie, the Debbie DeVos, um, or the, the Nancy DeVos, I'm sorry, I'm getting names confused here, the, the Secretary uh, of Education right. um, nomination, up until then, there were senators who were nominating every single Trump pick. And that's just not right. They need to be held accountable. They need to have their support revoked. They need to have their funding revoked. They need to have their endorsements. I mean, they need to be ostracized from the party, you know, or get in line. Like that needs to be it. like you are either a team player, you hold our principles and ideas uh, at heart, and you actually embody the goal of representing the people or get out. Like we don't want you. And, and I think that all stems to listening, that integrity, that accountability. So we're definitely 100 percent on that. Excellent. So, you know, when I hear you speak, what I like the most is that you are the one person, besides Keith Ellison, to be fair to Keith, that actually sure. has uh, demonstrated uh, introspection. Like you're able to look and see that, you know, not everything is peachy keen. Some things are really bad. Some people in our party are pretty toxic. And, and you know, we have to fix that. So I like that you're not willing to just basically lie in front of you know, people's eyes, uh, like other DNC chair candidates, like Jemu Green, for example, 
and mm-hmm. you know pretend like everything's okay like we're not unified right now we need to rebuild trust we need to make sure that going forward we're going to be strong against trump and whatnot uh but one thing that i uh, i want to bring up to you which has been a huge uh issue for the dnc chair race is lobbyist contributions so <laughs> i i've stated that you know i'm going to contradict myself admittedly here because i i don't want someone who's going to get in there and be an authoritarian and say it's mm-hmm. my way or the highway but at the same time when it comes to lobbyist contributions i feel like that's so fundamentally anti-democratic that it's a no-brainer like you should never yeah. want to accept lobbyist contributions so maybe on that issue i want someone who's going to get in there and crack skulls but on every other issue maybe we can actually have a discussion, have a discussion. about it yeah. so the thing about keith ellison that i want to bring out is that he has kind of ran on this uh this campaign of you know we're going to stop these lobbyist contributions and to me i feel like he's wavering i feel like he's saying um and not to make this about keith ellison exclusively but just to for you know illustrative purposes he's saying you know now we're going to have a discussion about it when it comes to lobbyist contributions can you unequivocally say that you're going to stop them if you're dnc chair and uh i have already made that pledge i know it's not getting around the uh the notification so much but i it, it's pinned to the top of my twitter i've sent it on the facebook uh, i absolutely we're getting rid of corporate money because um and and to your point about having to mention keith you kind of have to keith is the front runner or at least he's the front runner progressive he was the one that invoked the name he got bernie's endorsement i mean you have to he's going to have to come up in this conversation um but he's also my competition i i feel like this race is a three-way race between me because we're the only ones that are perhaps making a stand but i will toot my own horn a little bit none of those guys none of them not even keith were talking about money and and super delegates in the dnc process or introspective uh introspection until i said it in houston so i do want to toot my horn on that to that end hey, yes toot, toot. if you're doing it then you know <laughs> toot, you got you got to drive the discussion um, but yeah, the money thing, and I want to—I actually want to talk about it a little bit more because, you know, at first, just pure academic, just looking at it from paper, there has to be some sort of middle ground, right, that we could reach, except we're not talking about 30 years ago when everything was peachy keen and not everybody wanted to burn down the Democratic Party. This is today where there is no middle ground. We have to move forward in our party, which means we have to focus on just getting our fundraising from people. That means these $5,000 dinners that only the wealthiest people can uh, jump in on, even the $100 dinners or the $75 entry fees, you and I, well, you might, I, I can if I'm on orders. Oh, I can't um, either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying some, some of us are able to, but most of us aren't, and especially oh. not millennials who are still in school, still living at home, so on and so forth. We can't afford to be at the table. So if we're going to have fundraisers, they need to be like a dollar or a $5 entry. That's something reasonable and respectable. And if we are going to have high dollar things, then we need to leave that to the unions. So we talk about lobbyists. We talk about corporations. Absolutely, that has to go. But unfortunately, that does lump in unions, you know, teachers unions, AFL, CIO, stuff like that. Um, Costco, you know, Bill Gates. I don't know if he actually does donate to the Democratic Party, but I'm, I'm assuming we, we consider Bill Gates a friend. Um if he wanted to donate a big lump of money through Microsoft, through one of his organizations, we would have to hold that money back too, even if they are good people because of that image, that perception. Because if, okay, so how do we vet corporate money, right? Because now we're trying to talk about, oh, well, we can accept money from Costco so long as you know they, they do hands off. Well, how do we ensure that? How do we prove that? So rather than try and figure out a middle ground now, we can worry about that in 10 or 20 years after we've matured as a country and matured as a party and have actually gotten that whole debacle out of our face. And probably we don't even have to. I, I'd say way in the future simply because right now we need to make it work without. And will it be difficult? I'm not saying it won't. I'm not saying that the infrastructure that are currently exists is designed around small dollar donations. But if we are to succeed, we have to make it work. And we've seen that it can work with the Bernie Sanders movement. And therefore, I believe I am not shooting myself in the foot. I don't think I'm making a promise that I can't deliver on, which I think is possibly the most important thing. I absolutely believe we can uh, fundraise and, and operate the DNC from top to bottom with just small dollar donations. And I say that because there are 270 million voters in this country. The GOP is now officially 1,000% the party of the 
they are only in for themselves and for the wealthiest members of society. And people just need to realize that. Maybe most people do, most people who even vote for Republicans. What we have to do is tap into that 99%, that we the people, and we need to truly encompass that, that just inclusivity. We just have to be that party that any walk of life can join, whether you're conservative, whether you're moderate, whether you're Bernie crap progressive, what have you, we need to have the discussion. Now that might turn off some people who just wanna be rah, 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 but let's think about this logically. We are stronger when we are together and a bigger voice simply has more power, but more people involved in the same organization means more resources. Take that 270 million people. Those are, those are the 18 year olds and older in this country who could vote. One dollar a month from each of those 270 million amounts to uh, close to three billion, a little over three billion dollars a year. That is a game plan. That's, I think, in the order of 10 times as much money than the DNC generates on a given basis, even during a, a presidential year. So just looking at the numbers and the potential from those numbers, a more realistic one would be 30 million people donating on a regular basis. Well, what's 30 million times 12? That's $1 donation each month by those same 30 million people. That's 30, 360 million right there. That is in of itself more than what we get through corporate, uh, corporate donations, through lobbyist donations, through our friends and the unions and our wealthy donors. So to answer your question and <laughs> maybe bring everybody back to speed, not only will I pledge to do it, it is feasible and it can be done. That's that sounds fantastic. I think that that's what we want to hear. You know, it's not, you know, let's let's allow Bill Gates to give us money because Bill Gates is nice and we like Bill Gates. You know, I'm, I'm sure he's a lovely person, but it's just a matter of, like you said, the party needs to be more equitable. If Bill Gates gives money to the party, well, he has a louder voice by definition because he can give millions of dollars. I can't give a million dollars to, you know, the Democratic Party. So, right. he, of course, the Democratic Party will be more inclined to pick up bill gates when he calls and not me so i think that what you're saying right. is really important and that's one of the reasons why people are looking for progressives like you specifically these grassroots oriented progressives because you like bernie sanders showed you don't have to take millions of dollars from large corporations you can raise money from the people if you have that trust if they believe that you're actually fighting exactly. for them so now so kind of getting on to the point of you know grassroots uh and whatnot so Obviously, the DNC chair uh, or the, the race is going to be concluding pretty soon. They're going to be voting. So what can we do to help you? If we like Sam Ronan, if we hear, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we want to hear more about Sam Ronan, first of all, where can we find out more about you? You know, what's your website, your Twitter? And second of all, what can we actually do that would help you? Because as you know, the Associated Press is already basically calling the race for Tom Perez. So at this point, a lot of people are already demoralized. But what do you tell those people? And basically, in summary, to kind of summarize the question here, uh, what, do we, what do we do to help you? And how can we Our, find out more about you? Yeah, so uh, the first part of your question, I'll do my, you know, my pitch, my, uh, my, my, my advertisement. Go you can it. find me uh, on Twitter at Ronin for DNC. Uh, that's the same thing for Facebook. So www.facebook slash Ronin for DNC. And... My website is www.roninfordnc.org, so you, you can notice a pattern there. Uh, the only thing that isn't Ronin for DNC is my YouTube because I am apparently the worst millennial ever and I can't figure out how to name it that way. But it's, it's Samuel Ronin, and uh, I have 53 uh, subscribers right now and I think uh, uh, a little over a dozen videos. Um, it has a sign that says future ahead as the main picture and the, 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 the background picture is the picture of the sun. Um, now to how can you help me, uh, or whoever's watching, how can you guys help me? It, it's really the word of mouth. I could sit here and pander and say, like, give me money, give me money. But at the end of the day, money isn't going to win this thing. Not, not this race, because we have to convince 447 DNC members to vote for me. That's what is actually the, the big uh, trick that's being played right now with these future forums. It, it seems all open and people have their voice, but they really don't. Nobody gets to vote. You don't get to vote. I don't get to vote. In fact, I don't even think any of the other candidates get to vote. Um, we have to convince them, these 447, that their best interests are served by listening to we the people. So to that end, I have two things going. The, the next event is in Baltimore at the Baltimore Convention Center. 
and I'll, I'll happily send you the links so uh, you can update it accordingly. Um, we're organizing a rally. Not quite a rally in that I don't want you guys to actually participate and, and show up and, and, and listen to me speak and have fun at the convention, but a rally in that we need hundreds, if not thousands of people to show up and just have a presence. Because if we have a strong showing, I mean, if there are that many people there, th it can't be ignored. And what what the biggest confusion is right now is this isn't being covered by Fox and NBC and ABC and all these major news networks. This is a big deal. Whosoever becomes the next DNC chair becomes the leader of America or decides its fate at the very least because of the things we said before. If the party falls, the GOP is, is there it, and they will take whatever power is left. So it, it's it's make it or break it time. So I encourage you to um, you know follow me on Twitter and Facebook, like and share my posts, just get the name out there. I have a hashtag uh, that's apparently picking up a lot of weight, um, hashtag Sam Ronan. Um, there's a few derivatives of that, Ronan for DNC, um, People's Choice, Ronan, uh, you know, just whatever, as long as my name is in it and for DNC, we're probably golden. Um, the other thing is, on that website, the, the main website that I, I talked about, the .org, um, it'll take you to the splash page. It'll give you about a little bit about what my platform is, give you a chance to peruse uh, and ask me the question so we have a nice, healthy debate. Um, but also at the very bottom is the DNC chair listing. It's a doc hubs, or it's a, a doc.hub uh, thing, but it's a PDF. You can scroll through and you can either choose to contact your state-specific DNC chair members or you can just go down the list. I do ask, if you do go down the list through email, phone, fax, I please, please be respectful. This, These are the people who are in charge. Now, we want to overthrow them, so to speak, but we also want them to play a role, and we have to be cognizant of that fact. We, we can take over the party without giving the ax to everything in our path because that's not the way to do it. They, they have played a role, and we need to take the good part of their experiences and adopt it to our own while we're rebuilding. And, and unfortunately, you know, that involves having to reach out to them and being nice. Uh, I, if I could say otherwise, you know, don't no, just let them know, uh, Hey, my name's Johnny. My name's Sally. Um, I've been paying attention to the DNC chair race and this makes a really big impact on my life. And from all the candidates, Keith Ellison and Tom Perez included, the only one that I truly think would make me come back to the party as a Dem, Dem exeter or as a Bernie crowd or as a progressive or even as a moderate or Republican, the only person that I feel would truly listen to me and give me a chance to have a voice is Samuel Ronan. A message like that, respectful, multiplied by hundreds or thousands of people to each of those members, and this is a sure win. Don't think that I'm this outsider underdog that has no chance of winning. That's exactly what they made you think about Bernie. That's exactly how they spun Trump. And look at where we are today. Absolutely. No, that's great. So, yeah, um, I'll be making a call as well. And, yeah, you know, we, we can, <laughs> to follow up, we can be nice. And afterwards, if they don't choose who you like, then you could be. Angry. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, That's not endorsed. That's... Or, or is it endorsed by Sam? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, won't put you, I won't get you any uh, into any hot water. Uh, so, Thank Sam, you. is there anything else you want to say to my viewers before we go? Um, no, uh, just thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for letting me have this chance to speak. And, you know, uh, as, as silly as this may sound, I'm not used to having all this popularity. So it, it feels good to have, uh, be doing the right thing and being um, – credited for good work for a change. And you know what? This isn't about me. This isn't about my chairmanship or me leading and my name having the title next to it. It's about us having a voice. And I want you to remember that this is our revolution. So keep up the good work, guys. Absolutely. And hey, you're giving a voice to millions of people right now who are frustrated with this process. Uh, so, you know, keep up the good work and, you know, good luck, brother. Hope you hope you can pull this off. Support this podcast by joining the independent progressive media revolution today at humanistreport.com.